Lord be with you. And with your spirit. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Matthew. Glory. Jesus told his disciples this parable. A man going on a journey called in his servants and entrusted his possessions to them. To one he gave five talents, to another two, to a third one, to each according to his ability. Then he went away. Immediately the one who received five talents went and traded with them and made another five. Likewise, the one who received two made another two. But the man who received one went off and dug a hole in the ground and buried his master's money. After a long time, the master of those servants came back and settled accounts with them. The one who had received five talents came forward, bringing the additional five. He said, Master, you gave me five talents. See, I have made five more. His master said to him, Well done, my good and faithful servant. Since you were faithful in small matters, I will give you great responsibilities. Come, share your master's joy. Then the one who had received two talents also came forward and said, Master, you gave me two talents. See, I have made two more. His master said to him, Well done, my good and faithful servant. Since you are faithful in small matters, I will give you great responsibilities. Come, share your master's joy. Then the one who had received the one talent came forward and said, Master, I knew you were a demanding person, harvesting where you did not plant and gathering where you did not scatter. So out of fear I went off and buried your talent in the ground. Here it is back. His master said to him in reply, You wicked, lazy servant. So you knew that I harvest where I did not plant and gather where I did not scatter? Should you not then have put my money in the bank so that I could have got it back with interest on my return? Now then, take the talent from him and give it to the one with ten. For to everyone who has, more will be given and he will grow rich. But from the one who has not, even what he has will be taken away. And throw this useless servant into the darkness outside, where there will be wailing and grinding of teeth. The Gospel of the Lord. Well, we have entered the home stretch of the church's year, which ends, as you may know, when Advent begins. And the first Sunday of Advent this year begins on December 3rd. And with the end of the church year, we have the November Gospel readings focusing on the end of the world, or Judgment Day, to get us thinking about how spiritually prepared we are to meet our Maker, so to speak, whenever God chooses it to be for us. It's kind of like that Frank Sinatra song, My Way, and now the end is near and so I face the final curtain. Well, that's basically the theme for this month's Gospel readings. So last Sunday, this Sunday, and next Sunday all feature a story from Jesus concerning his second coming on Judgment Day. And all three stories come from Matthew 25. It's a very important chapter, a transitional one, since the one right after it is the beginning of the end of Jesus' earthly life. Because the next chapter has the Last Supper scene, followed by his arrest, his trial, suffering, dying, and rising. So let's just take a brief look at the meaning behind the key images in today's Gospel so we can properly understand it for our own reflection. First off, it's pretty clear who the Master is in this story. It points to Jesus, who shares riches with his servants, and then goes away for a while, and then returns at an unexpected time. The three servants in the story represent you and me, and all of Jesus' disciples who have been entrusted with taking care of and using many good things we have from God. The talents we hear about are not the same as what we would call talents today. We usually think of talents as abilities to do something, either natural abilities or well-trained ones. Talents for playing music or a sport, making arts and crafts, doing math, doing business, making talk, etc. 
There are countless talents in that regard. The talents mentioned here concern a type of money made of a precious metal, either gold, silver, or copper. And the weight of that metal, and where that metal came from, determine the value. So even one talent in the story can be worth quite a lot. Now it's obvious the master gave these riches to his three servants to make more with them, not just to sit on them and guard them or bury them. And when the master returns, he checks to see how they all made out. So it will be for each of us at the end of our lives. We'll be called to account. God is not going to judge us based on how much we had to begin with, but on how well we used what we had. Did we honestly make strong efforts to make our goods from God expand even more good in the lives of other people? How well we invested will help determine our final destination after this life is over, heaven or hell. The three servants in the story could actually be put into just two groups. Group one includes the servants with five and two talents. Those who make the efforts to obey their master's wishes and multiply the good. Group two includes those who have much, but did little, if anything, with it. Now, why did the one talent servant do anything with it? Says he was afraid, right? And fear paralyzes people. Was he afraid of failing in his efforts? Was he afraid of taking risks? Did he have bad experiences earlier in his life? Did he fear what others might think of him in these efforts? Was he afraid of his master getting angry if he lost it? We don't know for sure. It only says that he saw his master as demanding. So he buried what he had. And I think this leads us to ask ourselves this question. Are we honestly giving God our very best to be faithful each day with all of the good that God has enriched us with through his free spirit? Or are we squandering opportunities that he gives us? Opportunities to love, to learn about our faith, to serve other people, and to forgive while we still have the time. Or do we choose a safer, lazier, more self-indulging route to take through our daily living? You know, there's an old saying, a sacrifice is not true giving unless it hurts a bit. Maybe some people are afraid of feeling any kind of pain, and love does involve pain at times. Others learn from that pain, and they grow with it. What do you think the cross is all about? No pain, no gain. Earlier this week, I read about a retired businessman by the name of John Penn, who was a man who was diagnosed with cancer. And after many treatments, his cancer, thank God, went into remission. And during several trips to and from the hospital, John saw a number of sick people, many of them elderly, waiting at the bus stop outside the hospital in the midst of very cold weather. And their pain and discomfort was obvious. And that gave John an idea. He went to a local office of the American Cancer Society and he made this request. Give me a car and a little gas money and I'll volunteer my days driving these unfortunate people home. And his request was granted. And he did this for many years in his retirement, full time. A way of his expressing gratitude for the help he received in his time of need and showing compassion for those who were suffering like he did. Are we aware of the needs around us, in our families, among our neighbors, in our communities? Do we notice things that are needed but no one seems to be doing anything about? You know, it's important to not only dream big of what could be, but to do our part to make that dream a reality. If we want our world to be a better place for all people to thrive in, how are we contributing to make that a reality? One doesn't need to have much to make a difference. One could be young or old, rich or poor, black or white, healthy or ill. Everyone still has something of value to offer. And it may lead to amazingly good things to take place. One final true story to send that point home. 
One day, a 14-year-old boy, the eldest son of a potato farmer in Idaho, <coughs> had a dream. And with an eager mind to learn and a talent for science, he loved to see how things worked and attempted to fix things and make them work better. So, in the midst of his tinkering, he drew a diagram for a system that just absolutely wowed his ninth grade science teacher. And it conveyed an idea of beaming lines through the air that could become pictures on a screen. And with encouragement and lots of time and energy, he spent researching this idea more and more. Based on the insights of many others who have gone before him, this boy grew up to give us what just about every person in this country and in most of the world has seen or used at one time or another, maybe even on a daily basis. His breakthrough came in 1927, and he demonstrated his invention for the press a year later. His name is Philo Farnsworth, and he gave the world the first completely electronic television system. And he saw great hope in his creation, a way of improving people's ability to learn and communicate. And yet, near the end of his life in 1971, with 300 patents to his credit, and after many failed attempts and problems, including a drinking problem, Farnsworth lamented that he felt much of his work had been misused and abused and twisted by many people in many ways into something more harmful to society due to greed and other self-indulgences. <coughs> However, when he saw on TV Neil Armstrong walking on the moon in July of 1969, Philo turned to his wife and said, this has made it all worthwhile. We never know how high our dreams are going to grow where they are going, unless we act on them. God has given us so much, and many have abused or squandered such gifts, yet we can do so much more if we will it. <laughs>